So that any uh, hands? No. Okay. So Rich Chaffron is like the guru to the gurus. Um, you know, and I'm from the internet marketing space, so I kind of been in internet marketing for the past you know 15 years, I would say. So when like internet marketing was this real new industry that it isn't now, and then for all the gurus I knew, Rich Chaffron come in and he was like the guru to the gurus. And for the past you know 10, 15 years, I guess like he's been my mentor, and you know, I've done a lot of work and a lot of study under him. So. Frank Kerr is kind of, you know, as, the, as we would call my mum's here, by the way, everyone say hi to my mum. Hi, hi. Uh, Frank Kerr was like the big swinging dick of the industry. <laughs> and, um, and I found, you know, I found it really interesting, like, if his writing was very simple. So if you look at Frank's work, it's very simple to understand. It makes difficult things simple. So that's why I was mentioning to him, because Rich Sheffern such a complex guy. Such a really, you know, one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. And I, I, you know, he's a super genius. So to then study under the super genius to explain myself is easier to say. I, I'm like Frank, uh, just simple. <laughs> <laughs> I take the complex and make it simple. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Alex uh, from Wales. Yes, sir. And uh, just a, a brilliant guy. 
been through the ups and downs of life, and we were just talking, you know, our opening night speaker was about self-sabotage, right? And how we can get in our own way, and he's, he's experienced the ups and downs, and that's part of the, also the value of this group, and value of just investing in yourself. You can minimize or prevent self-sabotage at times, but you're still gonna go through self-sabotage moments um, as well. So I'd love, uh, I'd love for us to go through you know, both some of your celebrations, some of your failures, so that we can learn, but also, um, let's, if you wanna start from the beginning, from your background, to lay some of that. Sure, let, let me, okay. So wherever you I'm gonna bring it to this one. week. I'm gonna go to my background from this week. All right. So, um, that was very cool how you all just doing the high fives, getting the energy up, right? I just went to a maximum security prison last week. I went to um, Kern Valley State Prison. It's maximum security, level four. Um, when I went there, I kind of anticipated what I was walking into, but I walked into hell. And it was, it was hell. I mean, these, everybody that I was there with was there at least 14 years. Many of them have been in the hole for the past 10 years. Uh, many of them are never getting out ever in their lives. It was, so now I'm sitting down like this, but everybody is super duper dangerous. And the only warning was no warning shots. And I'm amongst them like this, but sitting behind me, around me, it was, you know, everybody's got tattoos on their faces. I mean, it was a very dangerous, scary place. I've never been so scared in my life. Where is this, you said? Uh, Kern Valley. Uh, up, up past Los Angeles. Okay. So pretty much everybody I was speaking with was either a blood of crip, skinhead from different gangs, and they'd left their gangs, they'd moved into a new unit where they were now trying to get parole and get out. And most of them are never going to get out, but if they start doing different uh, exercises, different uh, um, degrees, they may have a chance. So one guy, to put it into perspective, okay, here's the word for today, right? Perspective. That's the takeaway. I'm going to start off with a takeaway. You get perspective with me. When I said that Michael said to me to come up, Michael's my buddy, but I'm not here on a Saturday afternoon just to uh, give a talk. I'm here to give you, you know, something that's life-changing. And life-changing is thrown around so easily, the word life, the words, you know? But when I leave, my aim is that at least one of your lives change forever. Hopefully all of you. But that's, that's what I'm here for. So the word is perspective, that's the takeaway. Okay, now we've got the takeaway. Um, walking out of a, a maximum security prison will give you perspective. I went there selfishly because I was stressed. Um, basically, I'm in a, in a mastermind. It's a $25,000 mastermind, it's called Genius Network. Has anyone ever heard of it? Mm -hmm. It's Joe Polish's mastermind. And uh, when I was there in the, in the room, the cool thing about being in that mastermind is it allows me a place, a safe place to express what I'm feeling. So I stood up in 2016 and said I was an alcoholic in the room. And I told people in that room that I'm an alcoholic because I felt safe to actually say that. And then from 2016, Joe Polish has been working with me on my recovery. So I'm now sober, but through the end of 2016 to now has been many relapses. So many, you know, you talk about, you know, ups and downs in business. Well, now there's ups and downs in life as well we have, right? So there's a lot of, you know, good times, bad times. So I'm stressed with business. I'm trying to grow this business. I launched a new business uh, this year. We got it from zero to a million dollars in the first six months. Went to go to a million dollars in the next 90 days. Everything's laid out. I read data, I read numbers. I look, you know, I look at my numbers. Everything's looking good. Okay, let's get this business to, you know, to the second million in 90 days. We take off, and boom, 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 boom. Everything breaks. Like every fucking day, just like boom, boom, just everything. Man. So for the last three months, I've just been rebuilding the marketing department, obviously cause and effect. You fix one thing, something else doesn't work. So now I've got cause and effect, so now that I build all the sales, the marketing department, my marketing's beautiful, it's running so well, and now my sales process doesn't work, it doesn't match. Now we have to build the whole sales process, but I've now built a business ready, so obviously my business is very expensive, I'm losing hundreds of thousands a month. Stress is the only word I can explain. So, to put it into perspective, I went to have my balls checked at the hospital, <laughs> and the doctor ends up putting me on an ECG machine. Because I was so stressed, he was like, wait a minute, let me just check your heart button. 
So in our Genius Network, I'm saying this kind of stuff to my, to my peers and all of these people, and, and there's a guy there, Steve Sims, and he says, listen, he took me to the Oscars before we went to the Oscars, and I've been to the Grammys and all the fun fucking shit. But he said, I'll tell you one thing, going to prison puts things into perspective. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand what he meant until I went there. So when I left there, I realized that we have this, freedom. It doesn't matter how stressed you are, it doesn't matter how what's not going right, what's not going well. We can all make up this craziness in our brains with all of our own stresses and worries and that. It can actually go away. And, uh, and basically, before we dive into to my story, what I want to ask is a real honest question, because I think this is really important to each and every one of you. It's a very basic question. But do you know what your real reason why is? Put your hand up if you do. Okay, see the lack of see the lack of this? Okay, everybody's fucked. Seriously. And give me ten give me ten years and come and speak to me in ten years' time. Okay? This is how serious this is. If we don't start with it, I, I know this because I'm fucked. Okay? <laughs> but I'm really finding it because otherwise like everything's a like I hate the word grind. If any of you love Gary Vee, carry on loving him, I don't mind him, but the, the model that he's building, this grind, is not what we're meant to do. This whole new social media industry is not, like, pro where human beings are not programmed for this. Computers are taking over. The singularity is coming. It scares the fuck out of me. I don't like it. Yeah, I'm going next week, I don't know if you know who Ray Kurzweil is, but I'm going to be with Ray Kurzweil next week and Peter Mendes and all of these geniuses and the world's moving to this AI and I don't like it. I'm, there's my mum with me here. I'm from the old school gangster world in the UK where you meet in the pub and you discuss stuff in the pub and most of my friends from back home do not have these cell phones, they don't have smartphones, they don't have social media, they're criminals who meet in a pub and on a Friday afternoon, you go to the pub, and if somebody's not there, they've been arrested, and they've gone to prison, you don't see them for several years. That's where I've come from. It still happens. However, even though I don't condone a lot of the stuff that happens there, I still like that world, the underground world, the old world, because it's going away. The old London gangster world. You know, there's, there's, there's something about it that's just beautiful. But it's, 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 that world's going. It'll never be the same, you know? The world's changed with the social media. So, um, when I was in Genius Network, I, I shared that, and you know that's that's what I've come to. So, over the last several weeks, I've been thinking about why am I doing this? Why why am I put? Okay, so this is what I've done. I've surrendered. Okay, this is a cool one, man. I've surrendered. So when I I'm I'm the kind of guy you want in your corner, right? I'm the guy you want in your corner, like you do. My whole philosophy for years has been this. I do not fuck with anybody, but don't fuck with me. That's it, it's very simple. I'm not gonna fuck with you. Everybody, there's these people out there trying to be the internet police, trying to look after the, I have no interest, right? People are gonna think, I have no interest. I'm staying in my lane, I'm changing lives, and that's what I'm doing. Just don't fuck with me. Um, so, I find myself putting myself under a lot of pressure and stresses and, and I'm fighting and I'm fighting and, I'm, and, and there's conflict. And when I looked around, there's nobody there. I'm fighting myself. I'm in conflict with myself. And I found this a really fascinating understanding of it because I study, my study is psychology. Basically, I study people. So now I'm studying myself and I'm just like, wow, there's nobody there. Like all of this fighting, all of this, this conflict, it's all with myself. It's just me. Why am I making it so difficult for myself? Why? And, and you can't really go and, and, and the, the biggest problem for me is I can't just go and speak about this on the internet because you have to show face. If I'm the guru, then I, then I would love to be able to just speak about what I'm going through, but I have to speak to a larger audience, not my little audience, which would be coaches, consultants, service providers. But I'm talking the whole entrepreneurs. Then my buddy Billy Jean, Billy Jean's on to me like, go, you know, like, you know, he's like, his words is, he's mesmerized by me. So this is a big influencer, gets millions of views a day on his stuff, you know, big, big influencer. Do you know Billy is? Yeah? You know, and he's just like mesmerized by me. But he's like, you're selfish by not going out there on the social all the time. 
I don't think it's for me. Each and every one of us has our own path, our own way. I don't want to be some big influencer. I want to have influence, but I don't want to spend my time on the social all the time. So I need to find a way of leverage, and that's the, that's, if, if anything, my name is Alex Leverage Jeffries. You want to leverage everything you can, we can speak about that. I don't know how long we have, so I may stop speaking and, um, and let yeah, you ask. Three or four hours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what do you think, Mum? <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of conflict. So what I've started to do recently is start to look at what am I doing? Like, and I think my reasons why were wrong. I think I had the ladder of my success propped up against the wrong wall. I think that I was doing things for the wrong reasons. And I think that I've been building my life and my business off, off the wrong belief systems. And I've had to review all of my own belief systems, what I'm going through and what I'm doing and why. So if you don't know your reason why, we need to really look at it. And like I was saying, like I, because I, because I know I can. I've been chasing. Okay, and that's another thing: chasing, 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 chasing. I'm always chasing, and then I'm self-sabotaging. So my whole life was like this: underdog psychosis, which means I have. To, I'm an underdog. I like to fight my way up. I will fight my way up. I will keep going, and then when I get to the top, for some reason, I don't know why, self-sabotage, and find myself back down again. And this cycle was happening up and down, up and down for years. And what I noticed was that my self-worth was so low that my net worth would come down. So now this time as I blew up my business, this time I'm not blown it up in a good way, I mean blown it up, fucked it up. Which is fine because again, I, I'm really happy it happened because um, I wouldn't be where I am, you know, how things play out, right? Life's this journey. But this time as I fuck this business up, this time I say, well, have I self-sabotaged this? Because I went for it. I took risks, and it's fine. We're risk takers as entrepreneurs. If I didn't take the risk, I would have regret. And that's the thing that scares me the most in life is having regret, not going for it. But when I've looked at the situation I'm in now, it's not that my self-worth's low, my self-worth's really high. I can actually say I love myself but my net worth's low and that just needs to now catch itself up. And now I just need to realize why am I doing it? Why am I doing it? Because I, because this year I've made seven figures and also invested seven figures back into the business. But I could have gone a lot slower if I had my other reason why really structured and I could have had, you know, and I've also put hundreds of thousands of my own money in the top of the seven figures. So I've kind of like, I'm done, you know? But if I would have looked at my reason why, then I would have done things differently. And I think that what I've learned is that in recovery of being an alcoholic, what I've learned is that I have to put my recovery first over everything. Mm. And that's what people have told me. And then what I realized is I've always put myself last. I've always put everyone before me. So now I've got to look at being selfish. And as I've done it with my recovery for alcohol, and I've realized how good that's been. Now if I put my business to look after me first, and then look after others. Now we still serve, we still serve people, but we've got to build around us. Because otherwise we can build the wrong businesses. Can anyone relate to this? Yeah? Has anybody ever built the business from before? I have, <laughs> so many times, right? Okay, well, that's it for now. He can ask any questions or you can ask questions. Well. <laughs> so what's, what's that mean to design the business to look after you first? Them, I've been guilty of that. So, so I get guilty to other people. I want to look after other people on my team. I want to do good by people. I want to show. I want to show face. I don't want to. I don't want to um, scale a business back if I'm uh, um, if I'm looking to grow, you know, an audience. Why would I scale back? It just seems counter counterintuitive. Seems like I'm retracting. It seems like I'm, you know, scared of the the next level. There's so much to it. It's a very complex thing. But what I'm looking at is my own little ecosystem. So I come up with a concept last night. 
I live in California, so it's fine. I, and I'm being, I, fuck it. I was high last night. <laughs> <laughs> so my homeboy come over, and, and, and my homeboy's like this, this, this guru. He's like this, uh, he's amazing, isn't he, Mum? He's a nice guy. He's just phenomenal. He's just like... Huh? So intelligent. So intelligent, but he's, he's, he's like a philosopher. He's an incredible guy. And um, we were speaking last night, you know, in our conversation, I come up with the concept of high ticket ecosystems. Because I have these ecosystems in my business that I'm not monetizing or utilizing. And there's all of these little places where if I actually started to put them into perspective and actually, okay. So the other thing is, I'm always chasing because I always feel that there's not much time. So I'm always rushing. They, my nickname when I was younger was AJ Lush in a Rush. I was rushing around. I will not say certain things on the microphone, but there were certain things I was doing, rushing around, doing things. The people would just say, there he is. I'm in and out. You know, I'm a busy body. He, I'm here, I'm there. You know? I was doing things. I was active. Um, and then I transferred that over to business where I was you know, in, in a world of now ethics, I was running a legal business for the last, I don't know, however many years. 14, 15 years I've been in business. And then, um, so with the high ticket ecosystems, there's all of these little profit centers in your business that you can actually go into. And I've left them, and some of them I haven't gone into and taken extracted money out of them because I didn't feel it right to not have the other team members be able to have that money. So I put too much onus on other people to generate the money. And now I need to actually start generating money in my own ecosystems to bring in, to look after myself, my family, save money and so forth. So I can talk more about that in a bit. There's there's, there's money in all your businesses, what I'm telling you, okay? We'll find some money for today, is that cool? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna find money for, for as many of you as possible before I leave. Yeah. Okay. So, so for yours, where do you see, uh, what, what was, what was the shift of like where you see, all right, I've got a profit center right there, and then what's like your next, as an example, what's your next one that you want to tackle? Cool. Pack that for so, um, <clears throat> so living here in California is expensive. When I first moved here, my, my personal expense just on a monthly was 30000 a month, just my personal expense, and that's without spending. So now I spent. Um, so we're talking just you know, 50, 60 pounds a month, I would just be spending, which is crazy. I kind of still spend about 20,000 a month now. So I've got it nicely down, but it's still 20,000 a month. So the first thing I was like, well, wait a minute, let me just set up some private clients. So out of my, out of my, my clients I have, so I did a mastermind in my office, people come to my office, I had 10 people, I trained them, they were, you know, I looked at who were the higher level people that were to be easy to help. So, the more somebody pays me, the less I want to work with them. The more somebody pays me, the less I need to work with them. It should be very simple things to get the results. So, I basically brought on a $5,000 private client to get two calls from me a month. One at the top of the month, one midway. And basically, you know, brought on three clients, three private clients. That basically pays towards, you know, pays my, my, my bills, you know what I'm saying? So there you go, so I, what have I got to do? Like six hours a month and my bills are covered, you know what I'm saying? But it's more like this four, you know what I'm saying? This, this four, um, I got four clients, so it's 20,000 a month. Um, I did have three for that first mastermind. I took three hours there and I brought another one on. That's one way, you know, there's just private clients. Um, but then there's also other expenses in my business. So for instance, I pay a copyright of $10,000 a month to look after all of my clients' work, because I was doing it. I want my clients to get results, and it's 10,000 a month. So now if I just get another two private clients a month to cover that 10,000 a month, now I've bought myself time. So I don't need to work with all my clients, I've bought myself time. So if I can just sell a $10,000 product, how long is it gonna take me to do that? If I get on the phone and make a sale myself, I can get on the phone and speak to two people and close one out of two, 10 grand, or like give him the 10 grand, and now I've got all that freedom of my clients with me. So it's more just buying back my time as well for what is my reason why. Now my reason why prior was to change the industry, the coaching industry, which I believe I can do. 
And I also believe I can get access to the highest level. Basically, have you ever heard of Action International? Mm -hmm. Like this, like the, have you heard of these? The, like, and then that kind of level of people who have access to all the coaches in the world, pretty much, you know? Well, I can just go and knock on those doors and make that deal happen. So I'm looking at like, go in a joint venture with people who have the audience. So by, so I spend advertising about 50 grand a month on Facebook ads, let's just say that. But, um, and then like last month I spent about 88,000 on ads, but I'm gonna bring it to about 50. Um, and then also, I'll, I'll come back to that if you want to write, write something down about like how to... Well, so that budget is to an assortment of businesses or you're going after the high ticket? High ticket. And your acquisition can be, you know, very high because of it's such a high ticket item. So what, do you have a number in your head of like what's the max we pay for a customer acquisition? So, I mean, if, if you could put 50 cents in, and get a dollar out for every 50 cents, how many 50 yeah. cents would you put in? Forever. Okay. So it's, you know, now we can play the optimizing game. Can we can we get three to one, four to one? And then and then what I, then that's the game I was playing, but now I'm playing the game because, okay, now we're on a whole different conversation. Um, he who can spend most will acquire the lead wins, okay? So if I can out-compete everybody and get the marketplace, and now I own the marketplace, now I can do whatever I want in my ecosystem. I can sell them all stuff, basically. So I don't mind at this point if I can just, for instance, cover my own bills, my own living cost here in San Diego, cover my little operation, which um, could be like 100,000 a month, let's say, right? Just to cover like the running of the business. And then bring in enough leads and so forth to now start doing masterminds and so forth where I can save 1,500,000 a month. And that's just and that's just keeping things simple. So I want to be a million dollars a month, but that's how I blew the business up and put myself into depression, stress, and all the worries and anxiety and all this stuff. And why did I do it? My ego. Just ego. I have a massive ego. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I went. I did um, an emotional intelligence seminar. There was celebrities in there. There was all of these, you know, big American football players. I had the biggest ego in the room, and everyone knew it. Taxing me like fuck. Have <laughs> <laughs> you ever done landmark or ask or, or ascension leadership account? Any, any, yeah, I just got a mile into So I'm trying to remove my ego, and, and that's kind of this shift as well. So in front of my mum, my, my, and I thought of this on the way up here because I'm like, I'm not, I'm stressed, but I'm like, coming off the maximum security prison puts things into perspective. Let me just be very clear, right? I was with a guy who was in San, from San Diego. When I was speaking with him, he said to me, Alex, I have, I will never get out, but I have 20 years to my parole, and I may get parole. So knowing that, that I can wait 20 years, gives me hope today. I cried. 20 years. And this was no, I'm not, this is not some movie, this is like, I'm in fucking maximum security prison. No warning shots. The only warning is no warning shots. These people are dangerous motherfuckers. When I left, I was like, okay, write this down everybody. No complaints. <laughs> Seriously, write it down, no complaints. Because if we think about this, right? This, who was I with when I said this? Just now this, this dude here, yeah? I said, no complaints. He said, so everything's going great. As I said, no, but I will not complain. You know I'm saying, like, look at this, look at this. I can't complain. We just got to take things into perspective. It's good. It's fucking real. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah please. Um, Jordan actually spoke at a prison, and I don't think it was like maximum security, like to that level, but there were people in, who have been there for 15 years and stuff. And our perspective was completely different. I went with him, and I was the only woman in there. They were completely respectful of me. They were so grateful that he had come, and they they kind of told us, "We don't ever have things like this to look forward to." Of course. Like this, like made our day. Thank you. Oh, of course. And they I mean, were so appreciative. Totally. When I walked in, so I walk, I won't take the whole story. It's like the, a respectful of time, and I'd rather share things to impact you. But when we arrived, I I didn't know what was going to happen. Boom. Drake starts pumping, God's plan. So I walked in, they had a tunnel for us, 
and there was just essays on every side. And if you've ever seen the movie Training Day with Denzel Washington, where they drop them off down the road and they, they leave, and they're in that little cul-de-sac, like that's what it was like. I'm like, oh, what's up, essay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, well, but they were very respectful and very yeah. thankful, but you have to take into consideration these are very dangerous people, Absolutely. and there was a lot of manipulation going on, and I got under the hood with a lot of them, but very scary. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's great. Other questions for Alex? Okay. Yeah, please. What got you from where you were, you know, your lifestyle and growing up, and uh -huh. all that, to where you are now? Um, I know it's obviously a series of events, but... So, I got myself into trouble. Um, so what's interesting is, so my mum's here with me, and I remember one time that I was at the top of the stairs in my mum's house, and my buddy's at the bottom of the stairs, and I, I nod to him, and he goes and does the dishes with my mum, okay? Really respectful, just like, you know, doing dishes with my mum. And then we leave, I get ready, I leave the house, and then he's got a big machete, when he, and it totally changed. As soon as he left with my mum, big machete down his pants the whole time, and he goes, I'm just gonna go and wet them up. Basically, I'm just gonna go out there and there's, there's trouble about to happen. And he was very serious. Um, my best friend was a straight gangster. I watched him do the most crazy things you can imagine, just consistently, over and over again. And now he's doing 20 years in prison. Like, he's doing 20 years in prison. I had a little spell where, like, I could have gone to prison for a decade plus, you know, like, I was on trial, they give me not guilty, right? Very nice to have the not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Puts things into perspective. No complaints. Huh? No complaints. No complaints. <laughs> but it's very difficult to, okay, so I want to get to the place in my life where I give zero fucks. That's the place I want to get to, but it's very difficult to get there. Like, I cannot give a shit about a lot of things, but like, zero fucks is a place of like, you know, I only think I can get there on my deathbed. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like a place where like, there's so much that, that you, we're hardwired to give a fuck, do you get me? Mm -hmm. We care so much why other people care, I don't know, man. So I need to, I'm really working on this for myself. Zero fucks. Um, but, you know, back then, I had an ultimatum from my wife, you can go to prison with all of your friends, or we can make a life together. Mm -hmm. So I had to really take stock on like the situation that I was in, and I found self-study. So I first of all found eBay, and as soon as I saw eBay, the auction house, I knew there was something there. As soon as I saw this auction house, I was like, oh my god, like, look at this place. Like I can sell stuff all around the world. So, so, then, I, so then I went into, I built an import business, bringing motorbikes from China. So I used to drive motorbikes every day of my life. Like, that was just my whole life, was driving motorbikes. And um, so I built an import business, but then I found self-study and I was fascinated with self-study. Because I, okay, so I'm a school dropout. Um, just without the, the full story, I'm a school dropout totally dyslexic, dysfunctional, just behind, the lowest of the low in the classes, the lowest of the low, like, put into like handicapped classes with like all handicapped kids and just like, a zero, zero comprehension for the whole system. It's like, literally, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was me, right? Just, fuck the system. Um, which is interesting, my, seven-year-old son who was seven yesterday has been expelled from four schools since we lived in California and we've been here less than three years. Payback, <laughs> <Hey, that>, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, but he will be a superstar. There's just like, there's no question of this. And this kid is just a phenomenal athlete. You know, he's just a great athlete. Um, and he can do whatever he wants to do, you know what I'm saying? And he knows that. I mean, I've trained him. He's a, he's a little assassin. <laughs> what a man, like, I don't know, I trained him, like, too early, maybe, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, he, 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 he thinks, like, he thinks, yeah, he just thinks he's the man, like, he, that's it, he was here, like, he'd be like, wow, little six-pack, walks like he's got a swag, you know. <laughs> Why do you get expelled? Huh? Why do you get expelled? Got he it. just doesn't even fuck. 
And and also though, but he, but, but, the, but, no, but he doesn't give a fuck. Huh? He will fit in the box. Yeah, but the thing is that he's, he has, he's he, like, oh, here, yeah. and he'll sit in the box. Yeah, so he has no comprehension the same as me. So what happens is that I would get really frustrated, I would get really embarrassed. It was very difficult for me going through school, because I didn't get it. So when I found self-study that I could get, and I really enjoyed, that's when I was able to take off. And then I invested in myself, and go to masterminds, and meet different people, and, and, and change my surroundings. So the first thing to answer your question was, I left my environment. And then I moved to a different environment, but that environment served me for a certain period of time, but then that environment no longer served me. So I said, I'm gonna move country, I'm gonna move to San Diego, and build a new life in San Diego. Now I'm rebuilding my life in San Diego. You know, now a sober life, but also a life that I want to live. You know, like, yeah. What's, what, tell us more about the life that you want to live and the life that you want to leave behind. Good question. The life I want to live is, <clears throat> is a, okay, so I worry. And if I'm not worried, I really worry. <laughs> <laughs> It's annoying, you know, and it's like, there's, there's, there's these patterns and there's these loops and there's these things I do. And it's like, okay, let me change these. So, <clears throat> for the first thing, a life with no complaints is a good life. Like, not complaining, regardless of the circumstances. I'm in a situation right now, and I pull up on my drive, and, and I say to myself, wow, like, this is a great scene of a movie. You know, it's difficult, but like, what a fucking good scene. Like this, this can inspire people. So regardless of how difficult it gets, I know that I can inspire people at some point in the future with this. And I also know that I can get myself out of this because if I've got through, my, my, my quote is I made it through adversity, not university. I made it through adversity, not university. So if I made it through adversity and I know it's always been difficult, why do I expect it to be different any further now? Why do I expect it to be easy? So why not make it as easy as I can? Don't load up the pressure just for the reason of loading up pressure. So that's the first thing, is life with less pressure. And uh, so Frank Hearn taught me, um, and I paid $30,000 for this, so I would write this down because this is worth your tuition into Zeller's uh, mastermind. He taught me stabilize, optimize, expand. You want to stabilize first, then you optimize, then you expand. And I'm telling you now, if I look at all of your businesses, most of you are looking to expand too prematurely. And also, most of you are going to be trying to optimize too prematurely. So you really need to understand what stabilize really means, because I fucked up this show with that. Because if I really stabilized, we'd be in a much better position, much better position. I underestimated the task at hand. I underestimated the task at hand. And I also underestimated the procrastination of task at hand. What was the third one? Stabilize, optimize, and expand. expand. Please. So if you say, <clears throat> we think that we sh should optimize or expand, but we, we, you said something like, we don't really understand yes. what stabilizing means. Yes. Please expand on what stabilizing <clears throat> means. So, can we so, really dig into that? <clears throat> so for instance, right now, because I'm now behind, I put myself in a position of behind and I have to go, okay, this is my natural story. I'm the underdog. This is my natural rhythm. This is where I get my best. As I'm driving here on the way up here, I'm fucking cheering in the car, my mum's in the thing. I'm fucking, yeah. Because I know that I'm now about to go in and do some amazing things in my business. I have to. This is where I come to life. You know, you, like, and now I'm gonna go and do that. I make magic. However, I don't want to get to a point where now I go and crash it all again to be in this position. Because I like the underdog story. I like the underdog process. So, how I'm going to structure my business is that my business now, uh, the running costs of my business, I want to be covered every month. So, I always want to start the month ahead, not behind. So for instance, this next month I have to I have to generate six figures just to get by this uh, coming month. That means I have to now, I'm behind, I have to fight for it. But I would rather the, the, the month covered. 
So I start the month, now everything is now exciting. Now I get to build upon this. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now my problem with that storyline is that I have, I have um, because we all have, you know, stories in our head, I don't want to not have to fight for it because then if I don't have to fight for it, in my head is I'm going to get lazy, I'm just going to lay on the sofa and I'm going to prove everybody right from my backstory. So when I did a seminar back in June, one of my, uh, one of my slides was um, my driving factors. And my, my number one driving factor in my life has been to prove my dad wrong. So that's a negative driving factor. Then the second thing was to prove everybody wrong. Because there were so many people who didn't believe in me when I was starting. But I've kept that narrative with me all of these years. Now, you talk about Frank Kerr, you talk about these, these people. I can assure you that there's nobody in the internet marketing industry who's created more success for than I have. Straight fact. Because I've been at it every single day, creating success stories. However, for some reason I can't emotionally attach myself to that, for whatever reason, and I, and for whatever reason I still feel I have to prove myself. So when I did my seminar just a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago or something, and I was using the same presentation slides, when I looked at my slides, I didn't have the same belief anymore. My driving factor is not to prove my dad wrong anymore. My driving factor is not to prove anyone wrong anymore. So I was like, oh, imagine I just change it to prove everybody right. There's so many people rooting for me. So many people who believe in me, you know? Why not prove everybody right? And then my buddy said to me, why not prove anybody, why not just, why not prove anything to anybody? Like, why do you have to prove anything? And I like that thought, you know? I'm sticking, sitting with that thought. Don't prove anything to anybody. I like that, you know? So, so I wanna, but I also know that if I have everything stabilized and I have a good plan and my high ticket ecosystems and I have targets to hit and I'm enjoying what I do, then I won't lay on the sofa because that's not kind of who I am anyway. It's just the story in my mind. Does that answer your question? Cool. I love the idea of having a running cost of your business being covered by the business before the month begins. It's a really good yes. uh, measurable metric. Yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah. So that's the stabilization aspect of it. Yeah. Awesome. And because then you, because then the mental because then you go into it like so like excited. As long as you plan, you know, have a good plan. If you by the way, if you don't start your months already planned out, you're behind. You don't start the first month, let's plan this month out. Like if you if you're not starting the first of the month Run in with that plan, you're behind. And the same with the week. You know, if you haven't planned your week ahead, you know, if you're going, coming in on a Monday morning, you haven't planned your, your week, you're in trouble. You know, there's only a matter of time before trouble's knocking on your door. So I always plan next week. And then also I have a ritual plan tomorrow, today, every day. I will not wake up, I will not go to bed unless I plan tomorrow. There's just no way that I'm gonna do that to myself, wake up because what happens is, you can wake up in the morning, open your eyes, and then it's like, reality comes in, okay, I'm a human being, um, I'm in this, you know, this location in San Diego, okay, what's going on around me? Oh, business all well, woof, fear. And it can just cripple you. And it, you know, injects into you. And like, that can happen to me on a Friday morning, but then on a Saturday morning, woof, human being, San Diego, weekend. <sighs> and I can have release and happiness. So I know we inflict this on ourselves. So if I can plan tomorrow, today, every day, and I know that when I wake up, I can ex I've can already planned it out and I can execute on it. The one thing though I've noticed is my thinking in the night and my thinking in the morning are very different. Mm -hmm. So I plan going to the gym in the morning, in the next morning, but then when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh fuck going to the gym, man. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to be at the gym, so I want to go back to bed. However, because I planned it and I'm accountable to a trainer, then I go to the gym, and as soon as I do my first stretch, what do I want to do? I want to be the hardest working man in the gym. And I get into that with it, man, and I get into my day. So yeah, so if I don't do that, then my day's bad. Yeah, 
Great words, Wilson. Uh, other questions for us? Um, Ali? Um, speaking of planning, um, usually we're working towards a goal, right? Yes. And you also asked the question, which is a really important one. You're like, who, who here knows why? You know, what's your purpose? Yes. You asked us that in the beginning. Someone once told me if, uh, if you don't know where to start, start with your headstone. Start with your? Your headstone. What it would say yes. in the grave. Yes. Here, lies, yes. here lies Ali Ibrahimi, a man who, yes. and then work your way backwards. I'm curious, what a, what do you think about that? Have you, have you, have you thought about your headstone? Or yeah, what do you I think about that concept? <clears throat> so the, 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 the concept is reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. That's the concept. If you're going forward, trying to figure things out, you just go down the lower rabbit hole. If you start with the end in mind, you actually start to think about where do I want to end up, knowing that we end up on our deathbeds or we end up with a tombstone. Um, see, mine, what I would say to people is, on mine would be unstoppable. You just don't stop. But I'm just trying to figure out now, like, you know, because again, I'm now exploring my own narratives and I'm just really, you know, trying to figure things out. So, to answer your question, yes, you can't go forward from here and try and figure things out. You need something to reverse engineer from there. So, um, um, does that play into your, uh, I'm sorry, I really don't know much about um, what you've done. You said you've been accountable for most of the internet marketing. I mean, I would love to hear some of the things you're proud of. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's fine, that's of course. I've ever seen or heard of you. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if that's an appropriate question, I don't know, Mike, yeah, you leave. Uh, I was going to ask you, like, <laughs> some of the keys to your success with helping okay. build out other people. And, well, what's, and I guess support. what's, what's going to be most beneficial to everybody, you know? Like, that's, let's just talk about that, you know? Instead of me just, like, glorying in my... <laughs> You know, I can. I can sit here and <laughs> sound before, amazing. Before yeah, I don't want to do that. I'd love to linger just a bit more on, yeah, please. on where your ego has sabotaged your success. And in and, and your story, I want you guys to also catch how his story and his identity, we've talked about identity, but also even how he's thinking about it, right? He's like, how can I buy time? We just talked about that yesterday. What you sh he's, he's got those shifts that we were talking about. So... Anyway, what in terms of how have you sabotaged um, your success with your ego, and then what are you reshifting besides making yourself first? Sabotage my success with my ego first of all is talking too much about my past. I'm not sharing my vision with people. Okay, I lived in my past for too long. Okay, to answer, to answer, which is interesting. That's why I was kind of like, hey, maybe I don't answer this question mm -hmm. and waste all of your time basking in my glory. You know what I'm saying? But don't you find the past has brought you to where you are today? Because as you were talking at the very beginning, I was very intrigued with the story about the prison and this and, you know. Of course. So. I mean, it's, it's, I'm told it's a fascinating story, but I'm also aware of this room and, and given something more that you can take away. Like I said, I don't want to just be here and have a talk. I want to be here and change lives. You know what I'm saying? So that's just why I'm being aware of. Um, so... So to sabotage my ego, trying to grow too quickly and trying to be the best. So try, trying to be the best in the industry, trying to change the most lives, trying, 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 chasing, chasing, chasing. They're trying too much, you know, it's like, chill, chill. Should we roll one up? <laughs> <laughs> what about um, if we want to pivot into like what are if if you were to give like some action items and some some like some keys to your success and how you've helped other people grow and maybe you can share it through a case study through an example. I think I think the first thing is actually caring, like being a caring human being. So what I watched in, in I watched for a long time in the internet marketing industry, people making money and not caring. Mm -hmm. And they would make money, but then I also noticed that they had they didn't have the longevity. So I could have made millions of dollars in the internet marketing space that I passed up. Many times, many deals, many <coughs> circles, many groups, where I was like, I don't like the thought of that, where where that short sighted, and even though right now I may need the money. I'm actually going to pass it up for longevity. 
I wouldn't want to be burnt by that. So I think just caring and actually like following your compass. You know what I'm saying? Um, secondly, uh, charging higher prices than you're charging right now. You know, charging more. <laughs> Like, that's just a great place to start, you know? <laughs> but don't you find that scary, though, in the beginning, that you have to, like, deliver and make sure you're on point? So that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. So that's, um, I deal with this every day with people, you know, this, this topic. So if you take yourself out of the equation, because now this is all your need, this is all of us, you know, me, 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 right? <coughs> You forget about us, and you think about them, and what they need, and serving them, and actually understanding value proposition. So understanding the, um, I work a lot with marriage counselors, and a marriage counselor will charge $150 an hour. And within five minutes, I can turn that marriage counselor into somebody who charges $150 an hour, to charging $5,000 flat rate, and having no time attached to the outcome. Because does somebody want to save their marriage and spend months, or do they want to do it fast? fast. They want to do it fast. So you don't have to attach time to what you're selling, you have to sell an outcome. And if you can get somebody to see the outcome, then they buy into the outcome. So you don't need to charge hourly. Like charging hourly is the, like I charge two and a half thousand dollars an hour and I think it's too little. Because so it's, like, yeah, it's just, it's my time, you know, there's time going into it, there's time preparing for it, there's time leaving it, so it kind of isn't, you know, there's kind of maybe, you know, this, this, you have to think about things, um, uh, charging more and, and removing time, if you can. And so you can do group settings, look at this, he's doing a group here, you know, I like training groups of people. You know? and, then, and then when you have a group of people like this selling them more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> They can do that. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and this is what I do. So to answer, you know, to answer this, it's like when I have groups of people like this, I am going to sell them more stuff because if I don't, I'm doing them a disservice. So basically, what I do is I look at what do these people need next. Mm -hmm. If I don't give it to them, then they miss out. So it's not a coming from a place of like, oh well, I can make more money from you. If I'm sitting here with you. I'm saying, listen, you're all going to give me money, okay? This is this is a given, right? Unless you want to miss out. Because here's what I can do for you. And now it's, a, now, it's, now it's their battle with themselves. Are they stacking up to the plate or not? There's nothing to do with me. I just receive the checks. And you give me big checks. You know what I'm saying? But, like, but people have appreciate that. Because I'm not, like, it's, I'm looking at what they need next. You know what I'm saying? And this, I think, is important. What, um... In terms of some of the clients that you've shifted, would you like to share a few of those stories? Because I think those practical examples I think would be helpful. Like I, I like what you've shared. That was well, look, really the, the first thing is understanding the, like who your target market is, and we all, you know, we all basically have a mass market. I can help so many different people, but I'm just focused on coaches at the moment. It's just like really what I'm focused on because I can get my message to those, build business around those and then replicate the business model into different niches. That was kind of, you know, that's where I was going prior, but I went a bit too fast. Um, so understanding that, then building a deliverable, so focusing on next, what is my deliverable? And not trying to complicate the deliverable, making it as simple as possible. See, people don't want to buy complex, they want to buy simplicity. So if you think you've got to charge more, and you've got to make it more complicated because you're charging more, you're making a big mistake. By charging more, you want to make it simpler for them. Can you give a specific example of that? Uh, yeah, so, um, what niche are you in? Uh, health and fitness. <clears throat> health and fitness. So, does somebody want to spend the next year reading all of your literature, reading all of your books you're gonna put out there, publishing, reading all your blog posts every day, watching all of your videos, watching everything you're doing, and you spend all that time, or do they uh, come to a retreat where you change their life in a, in a weekend, but you charge them $20,000, and they come as a group, and that's, let's just say that's all they get. But there's certain things they can go off and do on their own that really impacts their life. <clears throat> now we've just removed a lot of time, like instead of charging $10, $10 a month, upselling, it's called the Ascension Ladder, okay? 
Uh, have you all heard of a tripwire? Yeah. A tripwire is just basically a self-liquidating mm -hmm. offer. That's all it is, right? But you, you're turning somebody from a suspect or a prospect into a customer, and then you can sell that customer and that becomes a client. So the, pros the process is suspect, prospect, customer, client, raven, fan. Suspect, prospect, customer, client, raven, fan. Can you say that one more time? Suspect, prospect, customer, client, raving fan. So um, it's difficult to take a, sus a suspect to a raving fan, but you can take a suspect to a client without them being a prospect or a customer. Um, so depending on where the question is stemming from, you asked me to explain more of what was that? Um, so when you were saying, you know, a lot of, when, when you have these high price points, we feel like we got to like tell them all these deliverables yeah. versus simplifying it. So I was just wondering like kind of what your language is when you say you simplify it. So I put it down to energy. I don't teach it this way, but everybody has energy dispersed. So we call it dispersed energy. And what I look for is the path of least resistance. So you can call it the immediate objective map, or the IO map. This comes from the theory of constraints. So an immediate objective map is what is the least amount that we can do to get the maximum outcome. Yep. You're gonna, okay, this is why the 10X, like your Grand Cadone's formula 10X, or also my mentor Dan Sullivan's formula is 10X. If you go to, if you aim to make a million dollars a month, when you, let's just say you want to make $100,000 a month, okay? Well, $100,000 a month, to build up to that, you put so much onus on or emphasis on all of the small things to get there because that's the ultimate ideal. So you put so much into it. But if you aim to make a million dollars a month, you kind of just bypass a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. It makes total sense. Yeah, so you, so you just simplify so much just by reaching. And that's that's the, what the, that's what it that's what it really is, you know. When you when you go to 10x, you can simplify so much. So what I do is I sell people on an ideal outcome. Let's say I'm launching a new coaching program or a new mastermind or anything. I have nothing built, nothing designed. I'm just selling an ideal outcome. I'm going to get people emotionally attached to the outcome and sell them based on that outcome. And I'm going to deliver. And then I deliver in real time with the people. And I don't think about everything, because I'm not smart enough to think about everything. I allow them to think of questions, they ask me questions, then I answer the questions, I call this client-driven content. So I'm gonna build my content based on my first group of people, my founding members. So I'll sell them for a lower price. Like when I launched my program recently, it was $6,000 to start. Then we put our price up, now the price is 12,000. I have more prices above that, like 25,000, 60,000. If I start off at 6,000, got a good base of people, good community, and then from there. But keep it simple. Julie? I was just wondering, when you start with the clients that you started with at $6,000 and you bump up to 12 and so on, how does your authority level change, right? Like when you're speaking to your six grand a month client versus your sixty thousand dollar a month client, like are you getting that much better clients that are sixty thousand dollars? I, I, it's not a month. It's like just six thousand flat. Oh, that's right. Just that's or right. sixty thousand. Yeah, or sixty thousand a year. Um, I wouldn't take a random person. It's very yeah. I, I want to train my people. So it's called controlling your herd. Right? Like Dan, uh, Dan Kennedy talks about controlling your herd. Does anybody study Dan Kennedy? So it's like, you know, controlling your herd is like, I want to train my people to act how I want them to act. If they make excuses in the real world, they don't make excuses in my world. If they're moaning and bitching in the real world, don't moan and bitch in my world. You know what I'm saying? So you want to control these people, so the more you can actually get people into your kind of way, then they can pay you more money and just be simple. So I tell people, look, if you're going to be a private client of mine, you're not going to get a lot from me. You're going to get what you need. Don't think we're going to talk about all of this stuff and it's going to be this. No, we're going to just speak about like the leverage and then just go and do it and get results.
we can talk about other stuff elsewhere. But like, when people pay me more money, I just keep it really focused. Don't bother me. Don't bother me. Don't bother me. But I get the results. Like they get crazy results, you know. Because like, they're action oriented. Because they they've invested heavily. And also, I've trained them on the basics. So I've taken them through series. And it's normally just like a lot of what, what I deal with is a lot of sit like people just make things too complex for themselves. So I think a private client, all I'm doing is removing all of the stuff they don't know how to plan effectively. So I remove all the stuff. They so just do these things, and then hold them accountable to do those things. And then each Friday they have to be accountable to me. You know, just send them an email saying, "Hey, either I feel fulfilled this week because, or I feel fucked off because." And I'm just I give people okay. I sell awareness at that level. I'm, I'm allowing them to be aware. And I sell accountability, but I, I don't, I'm actually not holding them accountable. They're just emailing me, thinking. It's just the basis of emailing me. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Cool. Are there any patterns between these, these clients? You know? Yeah, they all, they all self-sabotage. So they're all scared. They all have fear. So I run, I run, I run, um, I run these events, and, and the, um, in June there was 50 people in my room, and by day two we had to get 50 extra boxes of tissues because mm. everyone was just crying their eyes out. So I do certain things in the room, and I and I, I go vulnerable first, and then I start having people open up, and I have a way of, of doing it. And uh, what I, the reason I'm able to do them on such a you know, and they're hugely profitable in these, in these events, which is crazy profitable. Um, everybody's the same. Everybody has these similar patterns. Self-sabotage, you know, they worry, they have these fears, fears of failure, fears of success between the two. They, uh, they, they care too much what other people think. It's just real simple stuff, but it really affects people. How quickly can you recognize between those two which one it is and is it the same solution? Let me ask you a question. Are you scared of success or failure? I'm curious. I don't know. I'm asking you the question. I, I think it's your success. Okay, so that's how I do it. I ask the question and I have them write down. And I don't really categorize them, but there's a fear there. I don't care. Because people are either dri driven towards or driven away from. So I live in one of the richest neighborhoods in America. Not because I want to live in one of the richest neighborhoods in America. Because I don't want to be in poverty. I want to be as far away from poverty as possible. I'm driven away from, not driven towards. I want to drive Rolls Royce, but it's not like I am because I can. You know what I'm saying? It's not because I want to like be amongst the because I don't want to drive right first half. So it's you either driven away from or driven towards, but it doesn't matter with my training, because like there's a shift, you know what I'm saying? So if you're scared of success or scared of failure we're still gonna hit the fear head on. And then we need a shift to no longer be scared. To use it to your advantage. And that's great for creating emotional leverage within yourself and being anchored to the why and the, to that part that comes yeah. in. Or? Yeah, because like, if we can use your fear as now the, the, the drive, the dangerous. It's like, um, so you say you're scared of what success? Scared of success, okay. So what happens when you're scared of success? I don't know. I just chose that one because I'm a risk taker by nature, so I know it's not failure. I always try to learn from if there's a mistake or something like that, so I know to look positively at those situations, so I assume it's success. But I'm not sure. I, Sure, I can go into a, like I can go into a whole conversation here about it. It's kind of like, you know, the whole thing is there is no failure. There's only learning, right? And there's no failure unless you quit. So if we don't quit, so long as we don't quit, then we're not a failure. We're just learning. But how much learning do we want to do? Are we just are we using that as a storyline? That it's a narrative that it's okay to keep sabotaging because you're scared of success to stay away from it. So like how, so like I'm scared of like, I just don't like this. I'm addicted to this. And there's a whole social channel, I have all these channels and all these inbound things. So many people reach out to me, message me, 
and it drives my brain crazy. Like my brain almost can't deal with it. So that's when Billy's saying to me, he's like, bro, like, you know, he's a huge, this big influencer, and he is on my case, on my case, on my case, on my case. So I now have a videographer following me, and but it's not kind of me, you know, it's like, I just don't know if I want to be amongst that anyway. Um, but why? Is it that I'm scared of what people will start saying about me? Is it that I'm gonna get lost? I don't know, I'm scared of success as well. Like you can just like create your own safe haven. But to answer your question, like, you know, how do I do it? This fear, fear is driving all of us. So how do we just utilize that fear to drive us? I come back when you want it, you know, we keep going, but I can come back, it's like, I use my feet. Oh. I'm sorry, other question for Alex? Yes. You mentioned like this, this grind and this hustle, kind of get like your beast stuff. And that's yeah. a lot of what I'm getting into now. How do you, how do you what's the, the balance between like, performance and then not getting caught in that? I, I guess in fact, what, what's the metric now for what success looks like? Yeah, and I mean, for, so for me, it's like, as I was going to say earlier, I think my reason why now is to have a deep, meaningful connection with my wife and kids. Because for some reason, whenever I do that, I feel guilty of whatever like the business is, is needing of me. And there's always a guilt with it, you know? There's always this association of guilt, there's like trauma, so like now I'm, I, now I'm sober, I have a lot of feelings in my body. And I'm, I'm, I'm noticing these feelings. So I used to numb out the feelings. But now those feelings are there. Those feelings, if I sit down on the sofa, I can actually feel them in my stomach. I'm like, and they make me jump up. So I'm observing these, I'm like, oh wow, like, I'm driven to go back in the office. I can't relax. I can't relax, so I'm saying? It's like something in me that I can't relax. Um, which I'm working on, I'm just exploring. But um, the, the, the thing that I'm interested in to answer your question is I'm interested in how far am I willing to pursue success and when do, for freedom and when does success eat into your freedom? Where is that balance? And I'm just really assessing that. Now I need to, now I need to explore that and remove my ego from the situation. Because I have a big ego, like I said earlier. And I have to remove that and say, listen now, fuck everybody. Seriously. We need to sit down in a quiet room, forget what everybody thinks about you, or I'm speaking with all of you, you know, whether you meditate or not, what do I really want, truly want? And sometimes it's what you're scared of, you know? Like, okay, so perfect, here's my moment. One of the, the most scariest things in my life is to tell somebody who I love the most that I love her the most. Just having a deep, meaningful conversation with my mum is scary to me. I'm glad I get my mum to sit here with me and, and she share that, and now, how can I start to work on that? Like, this is my first step towards having that. Because it's such a simple thing, but it's such a difficult thing. I went into the prison and there's this guy covered in tattoos sitting next to me, like, I'm telling you guys, if you were in there, you'd be scared shitless. And the guy says to me, are you scared? And I looked and I said, no. He goes, I am. I wasn't scared. Not, not that scenario. Like, I walked in it to be tough. I walked in like, there's a tough situation, tough people. I'll go in to be tough. But as soon as I saw them letting their guards down, I let my guards down. I started looking around like, holy fuck, this is really scary, you know? The ego, I let the ego go. Um, so coming back to it, the, the, um, if my reason why is, <clears throat> is that, um, now I'm starting to explore how far am I willing to take the success before it takes over what I really wanted and what I really want. And that's why I said I think my, my ladder of success was propped up against the wrong wall. I think, I, I think, I've, been, I think I've been working off wrong belief systems. And now I've sobered up, I can actually start to be aware of them and, and take stock on them. And it takes work to acknowledge them. <clears throat> so let me, let me share this. Um, so I think this is I think this is a great lesson for everybody. So if you plan next week, and next week you should only have three most important tasks on your to-do list. 
three or less. These are things that are going to take your business forward. Then you can have all the secondary tasks and all the stuff on there. You have all your ongoing tasks. And then you can have, you know, as the week goes on, you can have all your urgent things arising. <clears throat> if you just focus on doing the important things first, what's going to happen is, I promise you, you're going to procrastinate. Okay? Now, as you start to procrastinate, you need to uh, be aware of why. Why am I procrastinating? And write that down on paper. Then go and procrastinate. Then go and do whatever you do. Go on Facebook, go and do whatever it is you can procrastinate. Go and do the urgent work because it's so urgent. I'll come back later and do this important stuff. I'm most productive at night anyway, so I'll put it off until this evening. Whatever it is. <clears throat> when you actually look at that piece of paper afterwards, that's the most important task you need to work on. What's holding you back? You can actually find, I call it the clarity gap. You can actually find it in that moment. But if you don't write it down, you'll forget it. It's like a slippery fish. What exactly is it that you're writing down right there? Yeah. Why you're procrastinating? Why what you're what procrastinating. showed up for you? What showed up? What you yeah, avoiding? because like <clears throat> you may be like you may need to do a sales call, but you're like scared of rejection. Okay. But you, you won't you won't acknowledge that you won't say that to people. <clears throat> it's not going to come up. But if you don't write that down, then you're not going to be truthful with yourself afterwards because you're not in that moment, which I call the clarity gap. Now, so this is a concept that I have. And, and I don't know how true it is, but I believe it. But I know if I jump in the air, gravity pulls me to the ground. I believe that there's that kind of force of nature around us called resistance. And that force like stops us. For instance, there's material stuff, there's walls. I can't just walk through there and be next door. There's resistance. If I ask you to go and get me a million dollars, which I would like you to give to me, there's gonna be resistance for you to go and collect that million dollars and bring it to me. You know what I'm saying? Like at what point in the world is that resistance? You hit it. Now you may hit it and you may get around it. So as so knowing that there's this resistance in the world, when we have this clarity, to, to answer this question, when we have this clarity, we write that down, and that's that's our real main task is to work on beating up. We're told the obstacle is the way. So whatever that is, if you're scared of rejection, face awesome. rejection. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, and sorry, on that note, you, you talked about the path of least resistance yes. and finding that and sidestepping and then it's kind of, I look at it as two ways because you said find that path of least resistance but then still maximize, you know, whatever that sale is or that, that opportunity. So are you, do you look at that together or do you first bring that path of least resistance and then wherever you are, then you're like, okay, now here, then, then that maximize or is it kind of you're doing it together or it depends what depends what level we're talking on. There's so many levels to this. So when I launched my coaching program, the, the aim was the path of least resistance would be that I get uh, clients results and here's the steps I would need to take somebody through to get the results. So a lot of, say, my clients make things so complex for themselves, and they make so busy, and they listen to so many different people, I'm just giving them the path of least resistance where they don't disperse their energy, okay? That's one level. But then there's, then we can go higher, like, because um, I was talking about, like, ecosystems, like, high-ticket ecosystems, but now I have, like, okay, if I wanted to make a million dollars a month, right? which I don't know if that's still my, I'm still exploring stuff a minute. But how much would I need to risk each month to get to a million dollars a month and for what? So now can I get, and now what, what do I really want? Removing my ego, removing stature, removing like, you know, the people coming up to me and removing all of that. Could I get that without getting to a million dollars a month, without putting up so much risk, without putting up so much time without putting up so much wasted time, without missing out, without, you know, can I just get to the same result quicker and easier and have more fun? That would be a path of least resistance as well. So I'm just always looking at what that is. And again, you can look at it as the IO map, the immediate objectives map. Yeah. Love it. I know you've got so much other wisdom. I'm curious. Is this good stuff? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I got two and a half pages of notes. Okay. Is it good, Mum? I guess. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
my son. Yeah, my children. Is your seven-year-old? No, uh, Blake's my seven-year-old. Cameron's my. Uh, that's my mom. That's my son. That's my wife, and that's my son. Um, what's fulfillment look like for you now? Great question. Such a good question. So, oh man. <laughs> So it's so funny, man, with my guru last night. And uh, so I, I have to like be aware of myself, my thinking, you know, I'm just, just, so my, my psychologist is uh, Dr. George Pratt. And he's a uh, psychologist that's some of the most famous people, you know, everyone would hear the, 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 the clientele that he has. Highly recommend going to see him. I totally recommend this guy. In our conversation, I find our conversations fascinating because, like, so he hangs out with Tony Robbins, been speaking on Tony Robbins stages for a long time. Tony speaks with him on the Larry King show, you know, just, you know, amongst that. Our conversations are so fascinating because he just always like just looks at me like this. You know, just, I've, I've yet, I've said very little of my backstory of, that she asked me to share, but we can talk about it another time. Um, and I was saying, you know, how happy I am when I'm financially secure. Just like how much more happy I am in life when I'm financially secure. So I have to now question, have I sabotaged myself recently to now be in a financial situation? Because I'm also happy when I'm the underdog. I told you I have underdog psychosis. So what's fulfillment? <laughs> fulfillment is making a decision on what I really want and sticking to it and not sabotaging it. So I really think that, you know, rekindling my relationship with my wife, with my kids, like, you know, enjoying my time outside of work and not being so driven with work um, would be fulfilling. What about one thing, I want to test this out on you. Yes, one sir. thing we've been talking about is you have an energetic home. Uh -huh. You have patterns. Yes. And so part of the unconscious <coughs> drawn to is the yep. ups and downs because now you feel alive, I've got this obstacle, I gotta rise up, I gotta find myself. Yep. And that's what has to happen to shift for you to shift that energetic home. So last night I wrote down that um, I don't wanna use up this energy in this way anymore. I don't wanna do it anymore. And it's really interesting, you know, when I, when I, so I'm trying to sh look at a shift in my energy and just like, I think my energy before was very frantic, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I can go and do it and we can go, but like, chill, relax, like, let's just, you know, make a good plan. Um, so, the question was? Um, what would need to happen? And, and really, it's a twofold question. What do you want the new home to be? Uh -huh. What do you want it to look like? And I know you're still fleshing it out, but if you happen to know what might be. I just think, if I can, okay. I want to build a business where there's no stress, no pressure. And I know it sounds like, you know, but like, I can have a business where, it, where it's really <laughs> profitable without all the ups and downs without all the uncertainties, without all the stress and pressure. I'm just looking at now removing all of that negative energy, frantic energy, and just having something where, please. Oh, uh, finish your no, sentence. No, no, I was just like, I was genuinely like, do you feel that you perhaps assisted energetically in creating all the ups and downs because it supported your identity as the underdog? Is that? That's, that's interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think it was self-worth as well. Yeah. Because I have imposter syndrome, which is basically, you know, you feel like a fraud. Mm -hmm. So like when people say to me, you're a genius, I find it very hard to even comprehend that because of when I was told all my life that you're stupid. So to be told you're stupid, 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 kept back in school, moved school, stupid, 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 stupid,
you know, genius, it doesn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? It just, do, just something doesn't work there. You changed my life. Well, I can't, I couldn't emotionally connect to that. For two reasons. Number one, I was told to be very successful, you have to emotionally uh, disengage with your clients. That's what I was taught. And I believe, I still believe that because they'll bring you every motherfucking excuse and story. And they will try and emotionally manipulate you. And if you allow it, then you're fucked. So there's, there's very strict rules and boundaries. You know, if you start working with me, there's no refund policy. And from that moment, you give me any excuse you want, and there's no money back. And people will try and pull every emotional thing with them. And then they'll tell you you've got bad morals and bad, you know, they'll throw it all at you. So I believe in that, that you have to emotionally disconnect because they will try and emotionally manipulate you. And if you allow that to happen, there's a crack in the door, and other people will try and emotionally manipulate you. And it's very interesting how they do it. And I've seen this across so many different, this is just people, you know? Um, so, I had a guy say to me, Alex, you changed my life and your program's amazing and thank you so much for the time we spent together, but can you give me the money back, please? I need to go and do some stuff. And I, you know, and I said no, and he couldn't believe it. He was outraged that I wouldn't give him his money back. And I mean, to, you know, and I've had people say, your program's amazing, but my gearbox is broken. Give me my money back, no, and then attack me. You know, so you'll, you'll hear all crazy stuff. So basically, first and foremost, um, I go into the game. So the rule is this, you pay me a lot of money, non-negotiable, and you pay me a lot of money up front before we even work together, non-negotiable, and there's no guarantee of results, non-negotiable. But once you pay me money, my job is to change your life. But you've got to change your life. I can't change your life for you. I will facilitate. So that's how I, I work with it. So first of all, there's, there's that. Um, so that's one reason I was emotionally disconnected because I knew that I had to and then people will try, they will fucking try. Um, and I've worked with thousands and thousands of people so I mean I've just explored in different niches, different industries, different people, different countries, it's all the same, right? Doesn't matter how much good you do, a small percentage are going to come after you. Uh, even when they say, they say in the same breath. Uh, they all say in the same breath, you know, thank you so much, you've changed my life, you're amazing, but please give my money back. <laughs> so you just find, what do you mean? And then they say, what do you mean, what do you mean? Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing then was I was obviously drinking a lot of alcohol and I was numbing out obviously a lot of stuff, so I couldn't emotionally connect. Um, so I'm just exploring a lot of it. But yes, I've sabotaged myself over and again. And I believe this time I may have sabotaged myself for the good though. Which is interesting. Because I think I was building the wrong business. I think I was building a business I didn't want. I think I've now become aware and enlightened, please. Now my question, I can relate to a lot of your story. Um, and I wonder if being on this side of sobriety, if you feel like the underdog thing has an addictive yes. quality to it. Like yes, it I does. like this feeling. And if you can approach it from that same model of recovery. Yeah, I mean, so it's so true. So here's what I did. In recovery, I surrendered for the first time in my life. Because as I mentioned earlier, I'm the kind of guy you want on your side, not you don't want to be against me. Just, this is just the given. Like, it's, if there's only one thing, just be careful of being against me. You know what I'm saying? Because of my nature. But then, as I've started to go through sobriety and realize there's a lot of strength in surrender, and I'm like, wait a minute, imagine I surrender to all of this what I just shared with you. And it's fine to be against me because I, I'm not going to take it on board. It's fine, like I'll just surrender. So basically I've been in a process the last few weeks of surrender, where I'm just surrendered to everything and I'm not fighting. I'm not going to just I have this no vision. Because, because here's the notion I've been under. That I want to put $6 million in my bank account. And when I have $6 million in the bank, I don't need anything. No money, because I can actually have enough money to live as I live right now for the rest of my life without needing to make money again. So I've been looking to put that in the bank as soon as possible. I'm like, let me do it. I have the ability, the capability, the skill set to do it. Let's go do it now. Put myself under way too much pressure. And um, somebody who I'm working with who's been observing me said to me, Alex, you've said this to me. 
the, the when I have all this, because I was on the, the belief of if I have all of this money in the account, then I need no, nothing. Imagine how I can serve if I need nothing. Imagine every single scenario situation I'm in that there's no need for me apart from to serve and give. I like that idea. But then this person said, and I don't think that's true. I think you would still find something of need, you know, with human nature. So I'm like, I'm interested. Then my buddy, who has millions in the bank, who's set for the rest of his life, he said to me, Alex, I was uh, on vacation the other day and I wasn't happy. And he said, and it wasn't that me and my wife and kids were not happy or content, but I was still chasing, still chasing, chasing, chasing. He said, I give up all my goals. I, I basically give up my cycling career. I give up all my dreams and vision boards and everything. And I'm living more in the present. I like that. However, I don't have that money, so I still have to like have awareness that I still need to pursue, but do it without chasing. So I'm just surrendering for the minute and just seeing what I want. And I know that putting myself first in recovery is the only way to do it. So I guess putting myself first in the business is the only way to do it as well. So being selfish for the first time, even though I'm going to serve, that's what I think. But, yeah. yeah. What, what would you recommend for us to how how do we put ourselves first in the business? Well, you like I started the reason why if we don't know what we're doing it for, we're going to mess up. If we know what we're doing it for, then we can reverse engineer what we want. So for so for me, it's like if we put our reason why and how we want to live, so we have our perfect average day. My perfect average day is very boring, and I like that. You know, get up, go to the gym. You know, I don't really have many routines, but you know, I like a simple life, peace and quiet. Um, it's interesting. You know, my mom, you know, where I live is so peaceful. I, I live in a gated community within a gated community. It's very peaceful. However, me and my mom, you know, when we walk around there, it's like very peaceful. However, I'm not at peace inside. There's a lot of conflict that I'm trying to figure out inside and remove. So. To, to go to where understand what your real reason why is and, and is this is this a false belief or a real belief? And what am I willing to put what am I willing to sacrifice to get there? So what's my reason why? What am I willing to sacrifice to get there? And when I get there will I be happy? Will I truly be happy? It's kind of what I'm exploring right now. Oh, you're you have a very authoritative energy and you mentioned you don't have any routines. You're talking that on the way here you're kind of yelling, getting kind of hyped up. Is, is that a practice you do to kind of come into a situation? Or? No, I told him I have no clue what I'm going to speak about. I just know yeah. that I'm going to touch you deeply. Well, that was my aim, is to, you know, not come in and people talk, but really deeply touch you. Um, no, I was just excited, you know, because I'm like, yeah, I'm in a situation where, it's a situation I haven't found myself in a long time. Now, I put myself in a situation, so I have to say, well, I put up a lot of risk, I went for it, and now I, I can't regret that I went for it. I would have regret if I didn't go for it. You know what I'm saying? It was there, man. I read all the numbers like it was there. But when I'm driving here, I started thinking about, wait a minute, as I was mentioning to him earlier, that if I now structure you know, these private clients that cover this, I, I have like my own little ecosystems in my business that I save this much a month, but I don't have to build this huge business right now. I can chill and enjoy figuring my own thing out. <coughs> so I was just kind of happy, like, wait a minute, I don't need it. Because like, when you start the month with a six figure overhead, like, okay, this month I have to generate a quarter of a million dollars just to get through this month. So as I started the month, I'm like, how the fuck do I make a quarter of a million when everything's fucked in business? You know what I'm saying? Like everything's fucked, I'm like, ah. So I'm on the first of this month, like, well, here we go. You know, it's very stressful. Have you always kind of had this uh, mentality through other industries you worked in, past jobs? You always kind of been this this person, or is this a passion that now kind of brings us out of you? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, um, there's certain things. I'm so I'm definitely street smart. So I come from the streets. So I'm street smart. So that's where it comes from. You know, like I understand people. Like people are easy to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. I can break people down very quickly. So when I'm in prison, I've got a, an essay in front of me, 
covered in tattoos. I'm staring him in the eyes because we have to do uh, these these exercises with them, and like it was like four minutes. So basically, um, if anybody done landmark or S or anything like that, then you know like you know like rackets and all this kind of stuff. There's things where you have to stare in people's eyes. Well, that's an empathy exercise. Yeah. So basically, what they're trying to do with us was to give empathy to these people that we could actually have a good conversation. I'm just staring at this motherfucker's eyes, and he can't stare at me. And this guy is scared shitless of it, you know? I'm not scared of it, I'm saying. So when I was in there, it, was, it wasn't that I was scared of the, I was just, was, I was in hell. That's what I'm scared of, this environment, because they don't get out. This was real, those doors locked, and you, you don't get out, and I'm like, well. Um, but I, I'm also looking to remove that narrative. You know what I'm saying? Because I've also sat down with, I don't know if my mum's man, I'm not gonna, because I'm here, but I don't know if my mum's been around, but like, I've sat down with the most dangerous people, the most dangerous in, in, in America. And I don't know if my mum's, maybe my wife and kids have, way beyond what I'm talking about where I've just been in this place. I've sat down with them, they give me respect. Like I have respect at that, at that level, I'm talking the highest level, I've sat down, so like, uh, for some reason, I can do that. I don't know why, but I'm looking to remove that narrative from my life, and that's a narrative of like being tough and like having like I command respect, and it's very evident. You walk around and you speak to me, and you're gonna, you're gonna know that. I want to remove that though. You know what I'm saying like I'm a definitely caring person. I always have been, but I just think that it's been a, it's, it's been helpful to get to where I am. But my mentor Dan Sullivan says. What got you to Egypt won't get you to the promised land. Mm. And, and I know you made, from the last time we hung out, you made the decision to cut off that part of your world. And it, it, we were talking about, we talked about decisions that uh, affect your life. And, and what led to that decision? And, and how do you feel about that decision that you made? It was like six months ago, seven months ago? Maybe that you're like, I'm cutting out. I'm not gonna hang out with those people anymore. Even though you haven't, you haven't. Uh, just because you, you, you stayed in somewhat, you were around them, but you didn't. You weren't. You just said, "I'm just not even gonna allow it." Basically, right? And, uh, when we had dinner back here like two months ago. So I could have done a deal earlier this year. Pretty much, it's like. I could have gone into a business where I could have, it was just, it was a very dangerous move. It was a very, very dangerous move. And I was like, why am I gonna put myself under this pressure and stress? And it wasn't, like it wasn't, it was way beyond any comprehension of this conversation. <laughs> but it was, it was a very big deal. And I was like, nah, <laughs> you know, like why would I put myself under that kind of stress and worry? And I mean, it was just way beyond, like, I'm capable of it, I know I'm capable of it. Or what? Is it my ego? I'm like, this is too dangerous. Fuck this, man. Let's chill. So, I'm looking for a more chilled life. You know what I'm saying? I'm really looking for like more chilled. And again, it comes to the ego. I like it. <clears throat> so my conflict is this. I want to have this big impact. How can I do that if I'm chilling? But what I really want is to chill. So I'm like, wait a minute. I need to chill first. If that's what I truly want, instead of going out there and serving it, I need to chill and get my shit in order before I can have this big impact. So instead of chasing this big impact, just stop everything, surrender. Now just be me, and now do I attract this? Can I attract this big impact? Can I bring this into me versus chasing it? So I'm kind of just exploring that. Great. Any other questions? Ben? I'm curious, what are like the two or three mindsets or beliefs that you hold that are like your superpower? Because yeah. what I'm hearing is that you have, you know, these self-sabotage things that you're working through right now, but you're still able to create these amazing results. So what are those things? Um, so, for some reason, my seven-year-old son, I took him for a, for, um, a psychiatric, psychiatric evaluation in the hospital, 
behind the glass mirrors and all that. They're wondering if he was on the autistic spectrum. And they put him in a, in a, in a, in a, and I went in the room with him. When he was doing the exercises, he could do the exercises, but I couldn't. And it made my mind, like, really, like, that night, my mind was really hurt. Like, I was really, like, my mind was really, like, felt like my mind was melted. Because there was things that my six-year-old, you six at the time, was doing that I couldn't do. And I was looking at these things like, oh, fuck, am I autistic? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been labeled anything. I don't know. But I couldn't do the exercise of sitting there. But when they were evaluating and asking questions, my son was responding with 100% belief in his response. So, I will have a tower. I will have a helicopter on the tower. I will have the Bugatti. I will buy my dad the Lamborghini. When he said these things, he believed there. No question like this, there's 100% belief in his mind. He, he sees Lamborghinis right there, he's like, Dad, I'm gonna buy you one of those. He believes that, like totally believes that. We speak about like being a YouTuber, and he's just like, believes he got millions of fans, like he believes that. I think he's got that from me, because I believe I can do anything. Like when I mean I've sat down with, I have sat down with, not once, but many times, the most scary, dangerous people. How do I get that? And have respect, where the, the, the plate's pushed until my meal arrives and is brought in. Like, so there's some belief that I have that I can do anything in this world. However, that belief, I think, also does me a disservice. I'm always chasing, and I'm, how how does that uh, coexist with low self-worth, which is something you brought up? Because there's two narratives. There's the past and the future. So like my story can play two parts. Like, you know, you can play the victim, which I didn't realize I was a victim until I did an emotional intelligence seminar. I'm like, oh, I'm a victim. Which one? Uh, Ascension Leadership Academy. You know that right now. Are you going through it, or are you going to do it? No. What I'm level? It right now. What level? Three. You're on three, you? Yeah. Okay, I quit too. Uh, who are you doing with? Here, with um, Phil. Yeah. Um, I'm actually a senior. I did it two years ago. So I'm on staff. What, what, were, you, what were you? What What? What one? Oh, what stretch? Ask you what, yeah. Oh, no, I did it in Los Angeles at MIT. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, huh? Um, yeah, I realized I was a victim. I couldn't believe it. It was mind blowing to realize I played victim. I just would never have imagined that. Like, me? Victim? Oh, oh yeah. Fuck. That's something to think about, you know? So, uh, there's different narratives to the same story, you know? Like I said, at night I can be one way, the morning the next way. So like, I don't know, I'm exploring it, you know? But I don't have all the answers. I'm still exploring it. So, um, I just think my confidence carries me a long way. Um, my belief carries me a long way. But then like, if I'm lost, I've been lost in my way. That's why I'm seeing that's why I'm trying to be lost in my way. I'm lost soul. So I'm just like finding myself, you know? Yeah. I'm curious what uh what, what what do you love about Alex? So what what is he what part of him really like lights you up? You know, you, you, you Mike has the ability to see the beauty I think in a lot. And I'm curious yeah. like, I'd love to hear like what, what how he really inspires you or his yeah. gift or his I, talents. I see the the goodness in him, you know, I think since we first met three four years ago. Um, I see the brilliance, I see the you know, I, to be frank, I don't see I mean, I know that internally, you know how you make decisions around your business, there's ego, but hanging out with you, I don't feel the ego, right? Like, I mean, you know, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And I don't, so I, I, I actually love the times of coming out, and I'm like, dude, uh, this guy's a joy, and he helps me think bolder, things bigger, things, and, and I, yeah, I think, and I see, I see who he can become and who he already is, but also who he's becoming. 
as well. And so it's like a, a joy to be around other people that are just saying this, each of you guys, it's a joy to see the transformation. I think you're, you're really real, you know, and, and, and you go for it in life, but you'll, you'll get back up and kick, kick butt, and, and you're making a difference too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and the love. I see the, see the love that's in your heart and your love. Yeah. That's uh, in that complete. Oh, sorry. You can finish. No, 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 please. No. So I'm curious. You obviously work with a lot of high ticket clients. Your sales process, I'm curious. Of, what's your kind of philosophy? How you approach that? Man, okay, we need more than three hours. Um, so, um, so, so with sales, um, you know, when it comes to selling, you don't want to sell people. They must buy. People must discover your program, product, service, not you tell them. So how I'm really good at sales is, or how to be good at sales is to be inquisitive. You want to be interested in them, and you become interesting. So, so does any does anybody want the truth about sales? Yeah. Like the real truth. So the truth about sales is that it's 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 um, it's manipulation, and people hate that word. And if you hate that word, find another word to represent that word. <laughs> but you must manipulate people for the good. If I believe I can help you. And I don't help you, then I've done you a disservice, so I should have manipulated you better to get you the outcome. For instance, a girl about a year ago, she was crying her eyes out giving me a credit card, snot dribbling down her mouth. I'm talking like crying, just like it was hysterics. And I'm just like relentless after the credit card. I could have let it go, but I mean, I really took it to a place where I put her into a corner, I played chess with people. And I got into a checkmate, and she gave me a credit card, but like dripped in snot. She came to my seminar in June of this year, so uh, about eight months later, I made an offer on stage, and she threw her credit card to me <laughs> on stage. So as I had the audience, she actually threw the credit card, and I found it fascinating in a in a space of like nine months how you can take somebody from that to that, and now she's paying me, you know, further. So you know, she'll she'll mostly end up paying me. Let's say eighty thousand dollars by the end of this year. Um, why does she keep paying me? Because I served her good, served her well. But if I didn't, if I didn't close her down, then she would still be in that situation. So I take that very serious. That it's my job to sell them, but to get them to buy. So I'm not going to be a salesman, I'm going to get them into a place where they understand and they start asking questions. Now, when they start asking questions, you don't lean in, you lean out. So if somebody asks you, how much is your program? The response is only one, a lot, more than you would like to pay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> Why is your program better than the others? It's not. I think you should go and work with them. <laughs> That's what you say? Mm -hmm. Well, but I've already, but by the way, I've already like okay. So like, I play judo with people, so I'm, I trip people up a lot. So I make, I put a lot of traps out for people in sales. So, um, so like if, at that point, if somebody asks me that question, then I'm going to uh, be able to go, come back to one of my traps. So the easiest way to come back to a trap without them even knowing that you've got a trap laid for them would be. Um, so it sounds like you know what I think is best for you is you go and work with them. Because it's, you know, it depends how they frame the question, okay? But um, um, let's just say, you know, they're asking about the competition. I say, well, look, I think it's best for you to go and work with them. So before we end the call here, which I'm about to do now, can I ask you a quick question? Why are you on the phone with me? And they don't even see it coming. All I've done is disarm them. I've let them know that the phone's about to go down. So like, you know, and I'm like, okay, so look, let me just take. Let me just. Let me just get off the, the topic. I'm not going to sell you anything here, okay? There's nothing for sale, so let's just. You know, let's wrap this up here. But before we end the call, can I ask you a quick question? Why did you uh, reach out to us today? And then I'm just going to go straight. They're going to answer it. I'm going to take them down. I'm going to keep going again. And I'm still selling them, but I've just disarmed them that they don't know the sales process is still going on. The easiest way to get somebody disarmed from 
thinking on a sales call is to end the sales call as soon as possible and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you say, this is I'm not here to sell you here. This is what oh, no, you can't buy anything from me. I'm not going to sell you anything. Are you going to fight like crazy to buy from me? No, 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 no. How much is it, Alex? It doesn't matter. You know, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're not going to want to spend what I charge today. And they're like, but tell me how much it is. And listen, you know. Look, for, to fix what you've got is a big problem. It's going to cost a lot. Let <laughs> <laughs> so, me put this way. So I, did, I, I just got back into sales because I'm, I'm basically rebuilding a whole, a whole sales process in my company. And I sold the guy the other day for $25,000 on the phone. For my first call that I have I had in over a year. And I'm on the phone with him, and all I'm doing is, so I'm finding pain. That's the only thing you've got to find on the phone with anybody. If you're doing sales, you must find pain and nothing else. If you're not going after the pain, you're a pussy. And I have to keep checking myself, Alex, you've been a pussy here. Because the, here's how the sales cycle goes. Here's how a sales call goes. You, you, you build rapport at the beginning of the call, and you want to keep them in rapport the whole time of the call. Rapport is a bond. You know, we're going to say, hey, where are you from? San Diego, amazing, I'm in San Diego, you know. Where are you from? I'm from New York. Oh my God, like I can look forward to going to New York one day. Just build and rapport, basic, simple stuff. After rapport, you want to set the frame of the call. What's about to happen on this call? So they understand what's about to happen. We're going to explore things. So I would do it like this. Um, so like, uh, so look, what we'll do is we'll have a conversation here, and, and based on this conversation, if I believe that I can help you, I'll, I'll talk about helping you, and if we believe there's a fit, we can do business, but more than likely there isn't going to be a fit, and more than likely I have nothing to offer you. Okay, I'm always going to be doing takeaway. So then based on, based on that, so we've got the rapport, we've got the frame, now we're going after pain. And I will not move until I have so much pain and I can sit down with you right now and we can start role playing and even in role play I can make you cry. So that's why I want you to be in a place of crying with me. I want that much emotional attachment to it. Then I want to be taken away and I want you asking me, so what can you do for me? I said, I don't know, man, there's a big problem here. Like, this is a lot of work. It sounds like it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you want me to do? I don't know. Like, can you help me? I don't know. I mean, I help a lot of people in this scenario, but like, I don't know about you. I mean, you tell me, like, what can you do of this situation right now? You know? Okay. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? And um, so a lot of takeaways, you always gotta lean out. You never wanna lean, lean in. So you don't wanna start selling them. You want them asking you what they have. And uh, if they start asking, like, you know, any guarantees, I'm like, man, you just asked the wrong question, you know? So, um, what was the question? <laughs> uh, Something that's, when people ask guarantees on a call, you might be able to use this, is I'll say, well, I guarantee if you do nothing, you're going to ex continue to experience the exact same results. Yeah, you know, it's true, but it's just, so, you know, it's so true, but it's just such a logical response, right? Right. So it's almost like you want to throw it at them, it's like, you want me to guarantee your success? Oh, we're done here. Okay, my program's off the table, my friend. Like, what do you mean? Um, you, you're looking for me to change your life? Oh my gosh, you, you got this all wrong. No wonder you've been a failure for so long. <laughs> Dude, you just, oh my god, I don't want to do business with you. Just, we're less than the call in a moment because you want me to guarantee your success? Okay, I remember the last guy who did that, we wasted our time for the rest of the call. So if you want somebody else to guarantee your success, then I guess you're going to have to continue the way you're going because you're looking for somebody else to make you successful. You just missed it. You're the only person who can make you a success. So before we end this call, can I ask you a question? Why did you reach out to help for me today? And they start going into it again. I'm like, well, I do that for a lot of people, but it doesn't sound like it can work for you. Because you want me to do all the work. No, you've got to do all the work. And it sounds like you don't want to do the work. You want me to guarantee your success? I mean, you have to, there's no money that can buy that. You know, you're dead in the water, buddy, and I can go back through all of the pains, and there you are, you're sitting. In, basically, I want you to sit in so much shit on the phone that you're like, I want to make the shit, like, so the point is this, you find somebody who's, you, you get them in pain, and then you take them so deep in that pain, I want to get pain, 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 I want to throw all the pain over them, so they're neck deep in shit, and they're crying, and I say, it sounds terrible, and I've got to go, because I've got stuff to do. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so what you're doing is you're getting them in pain, then you're... And I'm um, injecting. Actually, in the 
let's be clear, he's actually creating awareness of the pain that they're in. Oh, sure. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. So they're in pain. And then you're finding a limiting belief that's holding them back and saying, okay, we're not going to be a good fit. And then, so why are we on the call? Like, why did you put this yeah, why, why you, yeah, why you? Because it drops all their defense. Yeah. That's well, I want, to drop, I want to drop the defense that they think I'm selling them. I'm out of here, buddy. Yeah. I'm going. I'm going to have fun. You're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> More than likely, this will work for you. That's going to drive them crazy. Mm -hmm. What do you mean it will work for me? Well, tell me, why do you think this will work for you? Now they're selling themselves to me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sell you, you've got to sell me. You've got to come up with the idea that this is good. And so if somebody says to me, hey man, all I have is a traffic problem and all I can do is help them with traffic, I'm not going to say I can help you with traffic. I'm going to say, how bad is it? Like, I'm going to ask, so how much traffic have you been getting? How long has this been going on for? Why is it that way? Sounds terrible. Tell me more. Why, like, how does this affect me elsewhere? I'm building a lot of information around that and I'm like, oh my God, it sounds really bad. If you could just fix the traffic, do you think everything would be good? Is there anything else? Because there's another thing. You, you want to sell people so Dan Sullivan did this to me before and I realized oh, that's smart. He sold me on what's called the self-managed company. So I bought his program called the self-managed company and when I got into the program, he goes, now I sold you on the self-managed company, now let me show you all of this other stuff that I'm gonna teach you. But he didn't sell me on all that other stuff, he sold me on the one concept. So uh, David Sandler talks about this process which is called don't put a seagull in somebody else's painting. If they don't see it, don't tell them it's there. Mm. So you don't want to try and sell them on stuff that they don't want just yet. You find out where their pain is, you leverage that pain and you just sell them based on that pain. So the other day I got a guy, and this is the cool thing about price and stuff, I got a guy on the phone and I'm fine now, I'm like, oh my gosh, it sounds terrible. He's like, I know, I'm like, oof, big problems, big, big problems. I'm like, I don't know, man, it sounds difficult, bro. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, how are you waking up in the morning? I mean, like I said, I was saying to him, like, well, I remember when I was in your situation, I was waking up with fear, dread, because I'm being vulnerable. So I'm leading. I'm asking the question that I'm telling you. my situation. Oh, man, I used to wake up feeling the fear, dread, uncertainty. I hated life. What about you? Now he starts sharing all of this. I'm like, is that how you wake up now? Yes. How long has this been going on for? Three years. Mm. Tell me more about it. Okay, I'm getting all of this stuff. And then I'm just like, bro, it sounds bad. Sounds like you're in a real situation. I don't know if I can help you here. Now the guy's like feeling like fuck, like he's clinging on to me to help him. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I said to the guy, I'm like, so, uh, so out of curiosity, how much do you think it's going to cost for somebody like me to come in and clean up all this mess? He goes about $20,000. I was about to sell him a $12,000 program. <laughs> I'm like, buddy, you're way off the mark. I'm way more expensive than that. <laughs> so he burst out laughing. And the reason he burst out laughing was he, he, he liked my confidence. I was playing my role, he was playing his role. He laughed and I said it was going to be more. So I went on and told him my program 60,000, however I said I can do some stuff and we can do it for 20,000 cash for this now, but if I add this on it'd be 25,000. He just give me a 25,000 dollar check. It was really simple and I almost didn't, and then I said to him the other day on the phone, have you logged into the members area? He goes, you have a members area? See, a lot of people sell on features. Oh, you can get access to the members area, you can get this module, you can get that training, you can get... I don't sell on any of the features. I just sell on the emotional attachment. The emotional. So we've got, we got some gems out of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I want I want to basically, like, I don't know if I'm going to do it, <clears throat> but I want to set up a, like a class called like Closers Club, right? So it'd be like Closers Club, where you come on, you bring, like we, we can role play and stuff. And I'm like, it'd be $1,000 a week, and if you can't make more than $1,000 in a week, get the suck out. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so basically like it would, you know, so I, I love this stuff, is the answer. That's why I just want it. Do you, have, uh, <laughs> do you have that in any of your programs? Like where you just go through some of the scripting and stuff yeah, like that? I mean, yeah, you know, we have it, but you know, um, but it's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well trained. Uh, Way more than you want to pay today. Yeah, I have like masterminds in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah.
It's great stuff, man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was just going to ask you about you started on the phone. So what, what, is there a food qualification um, aspect to get somebody there? Yeah. So this is where my this is where my business is in trouble right now okay. because we were doing we had a certain business model that was good to a certain extent. So like. Say I want to make 100, 200,000 a month, I can run this business model. But trying to get past that, the business model wasn't sustainable. So we had to change the marketing. But when we changed the marketing, obviously the cause and effect I was speaking about earlier, that the sales process didn't hold out anymore. So we had to go from a one call close to a two call close. Now a two call close doesn't, you know, I thought he puts me on the phone, no, there's a whole, there's a real setup here. So we're literally in this world like, yeah, it's, it's very, uh, every day I'm learning right now with that. So you're relying on a one-on-one -on -one close? I was. I mean, I'll pick up the phone with you right now and I'm closing you. Like, that's the deal. Based on, like, you know, if you want the outcome, you truly want the outcome. Have you tried a live webinar close? With what, mass people? To, to what, like, live webinar to what? With 100 people. And to, to what, sell on the webinar? It's very difficult. It's what, like 10,000, 20,000? It's difficult. So application. For a higher ticket, for a higher ticket, you just drive. Oh my God, I just run, run, you know, so many webinars, but to application, not to sale. Yeah. yeah and then you take the application to the phone and sell it on the phone. Do you have lower ticket items? Of course. Huh? Do you have lower ticket course items as well? I, I mean, I used to launch a new information product every two weeks, so I'd get a thousand customers a week. I had a thousand sales a week of new customers coming into my business every single week. I'd take those customers, sell them high ticket. That was the suspect, prospect, customer, and then move them to client. So I take the customers, and now I move to a model where I now remove the customer. I've got suspect, prospect, Facebook advertising to webinar, to application, to phone. And we can close them, but it's a very difficult close. I mean, you have to be a good closer. It's like, you know, it's very finite, you know. And that's kind of where I messed up, was we, we built the sales team for like 10 people, and seven of eight of them couldn't do the job and everything started falling apart and my business just started collapsing and it was a very stressful situation. Um, so what I'm looking at doing now, um, I was with Billy Jean the other day and, and he was like, uh, um, I want to get all my people into this $500 lifetime program. I'm like, what do you mean, a $500 lifetime? He's like, well, imagine I sold them an eight week program then they come in the program, and then they leave, then they were part of the gene pool. They were part of my program. Now imagine I give them lifetime access to my program. Now every week they show up. Now every week I can sell them more shit. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. So what I'm looking at doing now, I've got Billy on my, on, with my inner circle on Monday, giving us, like, based on a brainstorm thing in front of my clients, is um, I'm going to launch a $500 program, maybe launch a $10 to start though get an influx of customers, get it going, then put up to $500. Um, run all my advertising spend to the $500 program, have that as a self-liquidating offer, so all my ad spend is is into that. Yeah. Huh? Uh, we have a similar model in mind that we're, we're planning on. I yeah, the yeah. only question I have right now is, because like I've run, you know, I've, I've done this before, my only question now is like, I need to sustain my business as I go into a transition, I transition into this new model, so I have to sustain what I'm doing to keep the team and like what I want the infrastructure to build. So, um, yeah, just to self liquidate and often then sell those customers because even if somebody gives you a dollar, there's such a different prospect. Well, they're a customer now. Yeah, the wire. yeah and, it, and, it, and it really mean it does mean a lot, you know, to have that in place. So, um, yes, that's where we're moving. Yeah, back there. Okay. So, so it, maybe going to a lower ticket, like you are at the 500, and then being able to scale something lower ticket where there's less resistance. Well, well there's not there's less resistance. There's no man power needed. I can sell. My problem right now is that my whole business, all my marketing goes to people. We get the leads, but those leads have to be handed to a person before they're c converted. It's yeah. just, It's just like, it's fine to a certain level. If I want to make 100,000 a month, then I could just, it's really simple. But as you start to go beyond that, it gets like really, it just gets messy, you know, and I've tried, and I, different time zones, there's so much, there's so much complexity to it, you understand? It's just, it's a beast. No lead is equal, 
you ask me about how I get my leads, I can talk all about like leads and stuff, but all I know is if I could remove all my advertising spend and put it into a customer pool and then show up to those customers every week and have those see me as the authority, the expert, you know, they're paying. See, this is the great thing about it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a program where whatever the product is, but you get access to a live stream with me every week. And on that live stream every week, I get to spit knowledge like this. Surely if people are paying me to like be in my presence, they would be like, wow. So I'm buying attention. And I can put those into clients. My only question now is what's the latency of that taking a customer to a client? Just as I'm transitioning. If I was just starting up the business again, like I was t telling my buddy how to build a business yesterday, whole different scenario for him. I'm like, you lucky little son of a bitch. <laughs> but me, I've got a different beast right now. And I don't want to get rid of the beast based on my own. Yeah. Well, there's also ethics. You know, there's like a team who helped me build certain things. I don't want to just remove them now. Like, okay, you've served your purpose now. Go. I kind of like, I want this team to come with me. Yeah. So it's more, yeah. So it's more like I have to now like put a sacrifice up for the team. Like how far am I willing to go for them? I have to like, you know, have to be observant for that as well. Yeah. Preston? What you're describing there, uh, what you're describing there sounds like a really, really rough problem. I don't know if I can help you with it. I just don't know. Uh, <laughs> I like that. So, uh, you, <laughs> what do I, the closer club thing that you're talking about, like yes. going through all the different um, lines and specific oh. things you could do with the closer. Would one of the reasons for developing that be to use it as a farm club for your salesman people? Because no. you said, oh no. no. How come? Okay. I just haven't thought of that process, no. Um, um, you know, could I do that? Which is a good, you know, it's a good, it's a good thing. Um, I think sales is a really difficult job. I think it is. And I don't think it's for most people, from yeah. what I've witnessed, you know. If you can, so if, you, if you're all into sales, if I can give you a gift, focus on the pain, agitate the pain, you go after the pain, and you've got to go after the pain, you've got to ask the questions that you're not wanting to ask. There's questions that you, you're not, you're like, oh, you have to ask the questions. And you have to explore. So basically, I'm told the sales is like a psychologist doing a Broadway show. You have to get into their mind, you have to be a great actor. If I had a guy the other day on the phone with me, and he's telling me how all his family are telling him he's a failure, and all of this stuff, and I said, do you have a, like, a girlfriend or a wife to support you? He said, no, she left me a year ago. Mm. So I just said, there you go. <sighs> he just burst out crying. I didn't need to, but I just did that for him to like sit with him, you know what I'm saying? So you've got to act a bit. Um, not most, most people aren't willing to do that. They don't want to take it there, mm. you have to. Because you have to get them emotionally engaged or they're not going to buy. Good stuff. Uh, so, is sales your the biggest challenge in your business right now, the bottleneck? Um, like if, if you're not wanting to be on the phone yourself is what it sounds like? Yes. Um, more of a sales process thing. Have a sales process breakdown in a minute. And as we've been passing these applications across, they've been getting infected. And there's, there's a process that it's a very finite process. Like, this thing, if somebody asks, I have a sales process right now. We're, we're working on building that sales process, and I've got consulting from somebody who's done this, you know, seven figure month level. Um, but I think that because we're trying to sell suspects and prospects only, it's very difficult to sell a suspect or a prospect for a five figure amount on the first phone call. Or, you know, now we're doing a two call close. But if we have customers, a customer pool, and I'm just spitting fire like this, and I'm, I'm like, sales is not an issue. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Yes, I just have time. We've been talking about high ticket items. We sell a $5 probiotic drink. So we got health, people are dealing with things as nominal as indigestion, bloating, or, you know, leaky gut, or Physical pain, you know, in terms of that, that system. 
Um, we've led more with, you know, this has worked for other people, and so we have, we have a lot of rich testimonials. Um, but we haven't gone as serious as, you know, as the pain, you know, pain, pain, pain. So I guess, is, is that because of the high ticket nature and having to break through on the emotional, or is that your viewpoint just throughout? Any, with anything, I think the lower price point, so when I used to sell five dollar products, I would sell like a flea market. I would just stack so much. Like I said, the, the lower the ticket, the more I'm stacking. When somebody pays me five dollars, my offer list is about that long. When somebody pays me, say, five thousand dollars a month, my offer list is like this. What do you mean by offer list? Uh, I'm going to stack the like offer. The value stack. Yeah, the value stack. It's just going to be this big long list of stuff that they get, you know, and I'm going to break it out. Like a flea market, you know, just lots of stuff. Um, and so... Is it the product characteristics? Or well, features and benefits. Features and benefits. Yeah, and then benefits of benefits. If you want to get into copy, which I have to you about. If you're selling on... If you're selling... I don't know your audience here, but there's the feature list, and there's the benefits of that feature list. <clears throat> then there's the benefits of those benefits. So what I would do if you all of your businesses, if you want to, an exercise to take away and work on, would be <clears throat> what are all of the features of my product or service? Live coaching each week, for instance. Well, what's the benefit of live coaching? So the benefit of my live coaching is you get to speak with me, I can fix your problems. Let's just say that's one of them. So every feature of your program or your product, every feature you can list down, list as many features as possible. Every feature, you want to look for five benefits for each feature. So if I do live coaching, if I do live group coaching, well, what's the benefit of that? Well, one benefit is you get to speak with me, the quote-unquote guru every week to answer your problems. You also get to listen to the questions of others, the questions where I answer them, you may not have even thought of them. You get the camaraderie of the group. You get other people to support you. You have a support network. So I'm saying these are all benefits of live group calls. Now once you have the feature, you have a list of features, each feature should have five benefits for each feature. I'm trying to find five benefits each. And when you get that, you want to find five sub-benefits. You want to find five benefits of each benefit. Then once you have that, then you want to say, you want to read that feature, then you want to say, so what? You want to imagine your prospect sitting opposite you saying, so what? And as you answer the so what, you're going to be writing in benefit-driven language. That becomes the copy you use in all your sales mission, uh, sales print. That's the conversation. That's everything they'll want to hear. You would never speak about your features. You just speak in that benefit-driven language. Can you give us a simple example? I mean, sure try to get it, but um, so uh, you know, group coaching class once a week. Okay, you get access to the guru every week. You never have to think about run the business again. We've, 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 all the problems that you're going to face, we've already figured out. All the problems you're going to face, we've already figured out and build a blueprint. We have the blueprint that you just follow so you don't need to think. You can, you can sleep easy at night. You know you can wake up in the days knowing that your, your, your business is mapped out for you. You know that there's the support network there to catch you when you're going to fall. You know you don't have to fall when you're surrounded by these people. You're not going to feel lonely. You can now be amongst a community of like-minded people who are there to, you know, celebrate your wins with you. So now you can have. Now you're no longer sitting in your in your room on your own trying to build your business. So what? So what? Um, so you can enjoy running the business and be feel fulfilled about what you're doing. Yeah. So what? So what? Um, so you can, uh, so you can um, uh, feel it fulfilled. So you can, uh, uh, so you can be in a positive mood. So people sense this positive mood about you. So you're more attractive. So more people want to do business with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, few moments to just acknowledge Alex and the yeah. big takeaways. What, what, what are some things that have shifted you guys? Um, I, I had planned on going 90 minutes and we went uh, a little over two hours. So um, thank you so much, so much Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, but let's let's give them a few big, huge takeaways, shifts, ahas that you guys have had that so you can have some feedback. Yeah. Julie. So I'm gonna go with. I'm terrible at internet marketing. I'm terrified of fucking it up, but I'm thrilled about the idea of working with like high ticket private clients, connecting with those people at that level and continuing to work there. And I'm not even kidding, like the level of relief when you talked about that, I was like, okay, I can do that. Awesome. So that was a fantastic. Thank piece. you. If I can just give some yeah. more feedback to that. Yeah. If you're scared of fucking it up, yeah. here's the response. I want you to believe that everything is going to go wrong, mm -hmm. and if anything goes right, it's a bonus. <laughs> okay. You just look at it from that <laughs> angle anymore. <laughs> and it removes all pressure, you know. You, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I just want to tell you, your experience and clarity coupled with your vulnerability is just so awesome and so magnetic and in, inviting and everything about that. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, all the jewels that you dropped, your cracking eggs and knowledge all over our heads, and you're so kind about it, and you're so, your energy is so inviting. It's no wonder why you're successful. So just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. Lindsay? I was gonna say just your presence and the certainty that you bring. Um, just being able to I can tell as you're giving the examples how you speak to people and like, you see that you can really serve them. And so that's the big thing I'm taking away is just the presence that you are embodying is, I think, the most powerful thing about you. So, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Great. So I have a high ticket offer with, with my business and one of the things that I haven't utilized really at all is doing heavy takeaways the way that you have just talked about and uh, heard that that was a big focus in Dan Locke's program, the high tech closer or whatever, and so it was something I was already thinking about, how can I incorporate that into my process. And so with that, with Dan Locke, Dan Locke's embraced it very well, I think. Yeah. He's just embraced the best study in the world and he uses that and he's just using that confidence. And that's his confidence has carried him, but he's, he is not the, the creator of any other thing that he's saying. Oh, sure. Zero. But he's stemmed it from the best and now he brings it. And it's good for them, you know? Where do you learn it? Uh, many people, but like Sandler would be, you know, Oops. David Sandler yeah. would be, you know, would be that. But <clears throat> once you understand how to use that, I mean, you can never go without. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Very easy. Oh, yeah. wait. Where are you guys going to do? Oh, okay. Anyone else? Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. I'm yeah. very uh, original. It's our original gangster right here. It's like, a, <laughs> in a good way. It's like, a, yeah, very yeah. authentic and real. You know, it kind of reminds really me of Jeremy, which I yeah. loved from my yeah. January. Yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. We were so engaged, you know, yeah. you know, so, bringing me to tears and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Good, you rocked it. Thank you. Patrick, do you have some? I was going to, so, sorry, uh, David Sandler? Sandler, S-A-N-D-L-E-R. David Sandler. Sandler, okay. Are there, are there any books um, that you would recommend kind of from, in this Well, area? from Sandler, there's, you can't teach a kid how to ride a bike in a seminar room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Any others of that caliber? It seems I mean, so for, for me, so um, have you ever heard of Agora Publishing? Yeah. So like, um, so Agora Publishing is like the biggest publishing house. Uh, the guy who owns it, the young billionaire in direct response advertising, and his business partner, I moved down to his street, like stalking. So I lived 16 doors down from him, stalking. <laughs> I found out his rhythms and patterns and I would be where he was when he was there. <laughs> if you're gonna learn if you're gonna learn from the best, you learn from the best, right? I mean, if you're serious about this, I mean I take my stuff serious, you know. Um, but he was just so so here's what he said to me. There's a couple of things, but like uh, one night out I was asking questions about like what old responder do you use? And uh, all of these things, he's like, you're a dickhead. <laughs> and 
And I was like, wow. He said, you know, I wrote, I wrote a headline that made $100 million of a letter. My last letter made me $100 million. You ask me what fucking email order responder I use? Why don't you ask me how to write a le headline, you know, headline? So I woke up the next morning, it was uh, August the 23rd, 2012, which is my, my wedding anniversary, and, and uh, I woke up and I phoned somebody who worked for me, so I quit. I quit running the company, you have to figure out you can run the company now. Because I wanted to work on the business, not in the business. And I wanted nothing to do with any of the lower level stuff anymore. So his book, Ready, Fire, Aim, what he talks about in the book is has go from zero to a million dollars, the first million. The only thing you focus on is sales. You just don't focus on anything else apart from sales. Now you can look at all these other books in this culture. There's so there's so much to it, right? Everybody has their own different paths. But as long as you focus on sales, and if you know that you can help somebody and you're not selling them, then you're being a pussy by not selling them. So you need to grow some balls. <laughs> and you need to start doing take on stuff. Because that gets you attractive, you know? If I'm trying to sell you, well, yeah. Yeah, please. We're closing about half the leads that we're getting, okay. so we're doing well. And so what's the price we're not here? Uh, 6,000. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. But I, mean, I am curious, would you say that the takeaway stuff, the heavy stuff, is more effective than five figure sales, or I mean, is it any in anything? I mean, it's like for the basic, si basic psychology. When you're a kid, you chase a girl, she runs away. You stop giving the girl attention, now you become more attractive. Very basic. I have a six year old, seven year old son. I chase my seven year old, he runs away. I stop, he looks at me, I run, what does he do? He chases me. Same thing. Just trying to be a bit more sophisticated with it in a sales environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you just make me smile. You're just so cool, and I love your energy, and I love that you cuss and you talk about ball sacks. <laughs> I just love that. But you're also like just uh, yeah. Aside from the the, the hard persona you say, you know, you're like egotistical and all that. You also have a very kindred spirit very gentle and kind, so I'm just so grateful for all of, the, all of your knowledge bombs, and you're just amazing, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Anything else, guys? Any other last party words or questions? All right. Alex, I want to acknowledge you too, man, just for just coming and just sharing, and dude, you got a wealth of knowledge, and you just, you, every time I hang out with you, dude, you, you challenge me to another level, and and uh, I got a few more books to read now as well, but uh, I, I think Allison probably need to do one of your programs at some point too. Yes, <laughs> and hang yeah. out and, uh, um, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I, I think if, if um, I think uh, even in the prison, I was saying this to the guys who were in prison, I was like, there's a book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just think like, if we just look at it from that, uh, if we just look at it from that perspective, and again, I started here with perspective, I'll give you perspective. Have we got perspective today? Yeah. I hope so. Um, yeah, man's search for meaning, you know, and then, for, and then from that basis, you know, knowing that we're going to die, if I just, if I just, if I, if I start there, knowing I'm going to die and I can come from there, that kind of gives me just, you know, okay, what am I doing here? What, you know, what am I up to? Yeah. So, how, how can we find out more about you if we want? Sign up for a program, a course, whatever, your $10, your $500 programs, or $60,000. Just go to the website. Yeah, I mean, the clientsinabundance.com is the website. Um, oh. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then on Instagram, Alex James Jeffries. Follow me on Instagram. Let's be friends on Instagram anyway. Let's just all stay in touch on that. A L E X J A M E S Alex James Jeffries J E F F R E Y S and obviously send me a message on there if you want to get in touch. And if you guys uh, uh, reflection time tomorrow if you're doing Insta stories, you know, and tag tag the authors, tag me, tag whoever, you know, tag other members that you learn from along the way to give them acknowledgement. Uh, yeah, so and, e and even just, you know, if you add me on Instagram, or please add me on there. Just send me a message so I can follow you back, just because, you know, I got a lot of people following me. I haven't got a big following, but right now we're building a following, so, like, there's just a lot of people, and I'm not following everyone back, but I will follow you back. And, um, 
<coughs> and then, you know, if you do ask them for business, just know the response is it's going to be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> However, we only do business if I know I can help you. Like that's it, you know what I'm saying? And then on that basis, you're in charge of getting the results from me. Uh, yeah. Awesome guys. Well, let's give give uh, Alex a round of applause. Let's, let's end the way we began, and then we will uh, uh, take three. Here's what I want us to do. After we do this, though, guys, and I want you guys to split in the restroom, start talk. I want you guys to sit down and and take make decisions on three to four things. Yes. That you just learned. Cool. Like we just had like just, a can lot. I just, of, yeah. Can I just do one thing though? Yeah. Let's forget the let's forget the three to four things. One thing. One thing. Because we're trying to simplify here. So if we 